My name is Dale, and I'm chair of the BCS London Central and North London branches. Great position to be in, great group of uh, colleagues I've got, and a super mission to bring information, knowledge, education to you and to help make IT good for society. Now, I've got a lot of colleagues here who are also um, with the same mission, as it were, and they are on screen. You can see Steve Sands and Paul Skinner. They are both from the ISS, uh, SSSSSG, Information Security Specialist of the BCS. So welcome to you if you're from the ISSG as well. Welcome to you if you're from Central London, from North London branches, from Information uh, Risk Management Association, that's IRMA. Welcome to you in general, wherever you're from. <laughs> now I say wherever you're from, from, but I'm a little bit guarded about that because ransomware is something we're all getting certainly aware about and maybe rather worried about as well. So I uh, put something on LinkedIn just recently saying, ransomware, what's in it for you? And I, Looked at that afterwards, I just thought, hmm, that could be looked at two ways, couldn't it? By goodies, like us, hopefully, who want to know how to combat it. And from baddies, maybe you're one of the baddies, I don't know, who want to see how you can make the most of the latest thinking and capitalize on it. Well, I'm afraid we're going to help in both cases because our two experts, Richard and Jonathan, are certainly going to tell you a lot more about this subject. And I'm going to first of all ask Steve if he would like to say anything on behalf of uh, his position as the chair of the ISSG. Steve. Thanks, Darren. Thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, and thanks for inviting us to share this fantastic event um, with everybody. Uh, we've sent all of the details out to the entire ISSG membership, which uh, I think is round about four and a half thousand members of the BCS at the moment. And um, it's, uh, it's always interesting when we do um, hybrid and uh, remote sessions like this because we get such great attendance. Um, and the other thing that I think is really, really good these days is how closely the various specialist groups of the BCS are working together where we have common interests. So. Um, ransomware is clearly an area of interest to um, certainly the information security specialist group that I chair, um, but also many, many of the other specialist groups. And, and of course, you made reference to the fact that IT is supposed to be good for society. Uh, I can't think of anything worse for IT than ransomware. So um, I'm very much looking forward to what Richard and Jonathan have to tell us this evening. Thanks again, Dan. Great, thank you, Steve. And also Andy and everybody from Irma, welcome. And there should be some real gems during the next hour or so for you too. Now there's another person who's on screen, but not on screen, if you see what I mean or not. And that's David, David Grundy. He is the Secretary of London Central Branch, very good colleague and friend of mine. And he is going to be our technical control of this session. And between us, we will handle your questions and your comments and so on. So if you have things to uh, ask these, uh, the speakers, the presenters, please put it in the Q&A. Likewise, if you have comments or questions, help, X, Y, Z, then please put it in the chat. We'll try and pick them all up and address your points during the course of this evening. Now we've got, a lot of things to cover. So I'm going to hand over in just a moment to Richard and Jonathan, and I'm going to ask them, would you please give a brief intro to you? I can give one as well, but um, I'd rather hear it from the horse's mouth. Where is the horse, by the way? I don't see it, but uh, I'll take you to a cover for that. Um, now, just one other thing. Richard, your um, leading slide there, I know you're ensconced in a dungeon there, so you're in a bomb-proof shelter, presumably, but what you've put on, on screen there looks a little bit like a battle plan. It's nothing to do with how to break out of 
Ukraine or anywhere like this? Is it the maneuvers you need to uh, employ to outwit the enemy? Or maybe it is. That sounds really interesting. Richard and Jonathan, over to you. Tell us a little bit about you and let's go. Okay, thank you, Dell. As usual, you're so perceptive. Yeah, for those of you who recognize this, this is old high school football play that I used to run when I was in my prime, and it was so successful. It's it's followed me through life. So anytime I need a good play, a good theme, I, I go with this, and it's got uh, it's called the end around, but uh, it ends with a hail mary pass. Thank you, Dallum. Uh, yeah, where do I begin? Um, first of all, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Hollis. I'm a director in a company called Risk Crew. Uh, sure, who cares? I know you don't. Uh, uh, but uh, probably the point in terms of uh, introducing the material is I've been doing this for my whole career. I've been at Risk Crew now for just coming on 20 years. Uh, we are a, a cybersecurity, governance, risk, and compliance consultancy and testing. We do penetration testing. But at the end of the day, I think what's what's important is that we, that I, uh, believe in process over product, okay? I'm a process guy. I'm a song and dance risk guy who talks about the answer is process, it's not product. And obviously you're gonna hear that in, in my point of view. But um, yeah, well, what's, so I've been doing this a long time. I've got a, as you can plainly see, I've got a one gray hair for every year I've been in the industry. Um, I don't know if that's good, but I, the good news is I still have my hair. All right. Anyway, and we're joined tonight by Jonathan. And jo I'm going to ask Jonathan to introduce himself when he comes to this point. I've tried to divide the material up almost in half. Uh, so uh, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, Jonathan Armstrong, uh, I'm really pleased that uh, uh, he could join us tonight. He's a lawyer at Cordery. He specializes in risk and compliance services uh, for clients across the UK and across Europe. Um, on subjects from, you know, working from home to GDPR to actual breaches. And uh, I guess what's important in terms of Jonathan and my relationship and in presenting you material is Jonathan's been my go-to guy when I have a question about legal implications, be it them be them breaches or compliance to to a framework. So he's been my go-to guy for years and years now. And and every time I talk to him, he tells me I learned something. And uh, so I, I, I was really keen to bring Jonathan's perspective to the table to add this to ransomware, because I don't think we're talking enough. We, we understand ransomware, but I think Jonathan's got some great insight on the legal issues uh, um, associated with ransomware that we don't speak enough about. Okay. So, but Jonathan, I'll ask you um, to, uh, uh, to introduce yourself and uh, say something nice about me when we come to your piece, uh, now that I said something nice about you. But um, listen, before we start, let me, let me start by saying thank you. Thanks for, for joining us tonight. Thanks for your time. I've been on a lot of webinars. You've been on a lot of webinars. We've all been on a lot of webinars in the last couple of years. And, and I specifically have been on a lot of webinars about ransomware and my uh, and, and I really, you know, thought, what could I add to this? What could I, what, 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 what can I bring to the table? That's something new. That's something valuable that we can all, that we all need. And Jonathan and I put our heads together, and we agreed that what we needed to speak about isn't wasn't being addressed. Okay, and. Um, in the industry on a, on a typical ransomware webinar. So my objective, our objective is to make this worthwhile for you. All right, I, wanna, I want this to be as if Jonathan and I came to your business, sat down, you got us a nice cappuccino or something. We sat down in your conference room and we just discussed some simple, straightforward, pragmatic things that you and your business can do immediately to come to terms with, to prevent a ransomware attack on your business. That's our objective. And I'd like you to hold us to that. So if you have questions, if I go too fast, cause I have had way too much coffee today because I'm usually in bed by like 20 minutes ago. Uh, if, uh, and you need to slow down or have a question, throw a question, but I wanna make sure that we give you some very simple advice and assistance for putting together and executing a strategy that's effective for ransomware. All right, so thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. Um, make me work for this uh, uh, next uh, 90 minutes. Okay, let, let's, uh, uh, let's see, uh, let's start at the beginning. Okay, so I've put together some, I'm gonna kick us off and we're gonna follow a really rough agenda. I wanna open with a couple of very specific points I'm gonna call rules of the game, right? Because I need a theme. My mom said, when you put together a PowerPoint presentation, have a catchy little theme, uh, put, and don't forget to put up your, your high school play up there. But uh, most of you all know uh, what I'm gonna talk about is general rules of the game. 
these are things we know, but I want to bring out a couple of points that for, first of all, to remind us, we need to continually think of these things when we're devising a strategy, uh, things like definitions and expectations and, and who are the threat actors and their business model and what are the points of entry into our business and the anatomy of a typical ransomware attack. We know this, I know this, you know this, we've been on ransomware webin webinars that have showed this. But I wanna walk through a, a, a couple issues and remind us why it's important that we continue to keep this in mind when we're devising a strategy um, to identify, minimize and manage our, you know, this risk of an attack. Then I wanna go through five components of what I think are a very effective strategy. I'm gonna call them essential plays. Five things that we need to do to put together what is what constitutes a very effective, uh, straightforward process for a success, you know, to prevent a successful ransomware attack. Then I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan, who's going to talk to us about some legal issues we all need to keep in mind. But throughout the whole thing, I'd like to remind you, if you have a question, throw it in. If uh, um, I, I, I'd like to address your questions as we go through. So, uh, so um, Steve, or I'm sorry, Paul, if we do get questions, uh, please could, Paul, could you interrupt myself? Could you interrupt Jonathan and throw a question in so we make this as timely as possible? But we do have time for Q&A at the, at the uh, end of the session. Yeah, absolutely. No problem that, Richard. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody ought to slow me down and somebody to should have told me, called me at three o'clock and said, Rich, you're a cappuccino over the line. And it's only three o'clock. So uh, if I do speak too fast, Paul, I'd also like to, uh, for you to just send me a little note saying slow down. Okay, let's get started, shall we? Where do I like to start? Well, I'm one of those simple guys who like to start at the beginning. Where, you know, I'm going to call it rules of the game. Let's start right here, okay? What is ransomware? I know this sounds stupid, but my clients, I have to remind them, the ransomware is malware. Ransomware is malware. What's malware? It's, it's, a specific, it's a specific software program that's designed to disrupt, damage, block, or, or gain unauthorized access to a computer system, right? Malware. Ransomware is malware. This is important to understand that we start at the beginning. Why? Because you and I spend a lot of money on anti-malware products to stop malware from infecting our systems. Ransomware is malware. Hands up if you bought anti-malware solutions. Yeah, okay. Why aren't we starting every webinar on ransomware with, wait a minute, ransomware is malware. We have malware uh, controls on our systems. The first point I'd like to make to all of us is why aren't we talking, why are we talking tonight about ransomware? We're talking tonight about ransomware because our anti-malware products do not work. Should I say, that? let me say that again for dramatic effect, okay? Our anti-malware products do not work. And so we have ransomware problem. And so that's why you're attending this webinar tonight. That's why I attend them all. But why isn't this the starting point for every conversation we have about ransomware? that we have ransomware problems because our anti-malware products don't work. They don't, or we wouldn't be having this discussion. Why is it that our vendors bear absolutely no responsibility, no accountability for this ransomware issue that we are talking about endlessly? The ransomware that bypasses their products and infects our systems. We have ransomware problems because anti-malware products don't work. We should be acknowledging that as a starting point for every discussion we have. Why? Because of the financial impact that it has on our businesses. Why isn't this a question of product liability? I mean, if, you, if, you, if we bought seatbelts and in the very first accident, they didn't work and we flew through the windshield, you'd look to the seatbelt manufacturer to, serve, to assume some sort of liability, wouldn't you? I would. Why isn't this a part? I mean, maybe it's not the best analogy. We're not losing our lives to ransomware, but we're losing an awful lot of money. Like I said, we've all bought the ransomware, but we've all bought the anti-malware product. We still have ransomware. I want to start there because for, for, for me, I think that's, that's not acknowledged. And I think uh, if we start to, to understand 
we've got poor controls in place, controls that aren't fit for purpose, we would start to go a little easier on ourselves and then stop, stop looking at products to solve this problem and more at a process to solve the problem. All right, so, but that's my point. If your anti-malware products worked, you wouldn't be on this webinar. Okay, and it's, there's a lot of money at stake. Um, there's a lot of money at stake. And this is why I bring up this issue about product liability, all right? I'm gonna leave this topic in, term, in terms of the impact and financial impact and legal, uh, uh, legal costs and things. I wanna leave it to Jonathan for a deeper, uh, a deeper dive. And we've, to some extent, we've, we understand how much, not just the ransomware itself and the ransom itself, um, but the, the financial impact it has, is, has on our systems at, at us not being able to get access to our data at the legal costs, at the reputational costs, all right, the stakes are high. I want to bring up, a, you know, I want to start up and, uh, and go on to a few points about the opposition, okay? They are really good at what they do, okay? Sure, you know that, but there are about 90 organized cyber criminal gangs out there that specialize in ransomware. As of last year, the top five were Maze, Conti, Revol, Netwalker, and Doppelpamer, if I'm pronouncing that right. All right, but here's what I want you to bring on board. Well, you, you, you know, Revol uh, actually broke up last year, or they're the ones in the news, but they were already forming into uh, splinter groups. And Conti's the one that just, you know, stepped out and publicly supported the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, all right, so these are the top five. These are should be on everybody's radar and understanding the, the, the ransomware that they use and how they use it. But the two points I want to, to, to bring out, one is they're organized, and I want to come back to that. And two is they're extremely well paid. We're talking about organized criminal gangs with definitive top-down hierarchies, hierarchical, hierarchicals, hierarchies, roles and responsibilities from managing directors to HR. I took all the way to code writers, the average C-level exec in an organized crime group of any of these top five that I just, uh, I, I just showed you is making about 15 million US dollars a year. So as of last year, a mid-level, 5 million, a code writer, the, 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 the people actually writing the ransomware code are averaging about just under a million a year. Do you know what an average developer at RSA makes? about 48,000 US. Now compare that, you know, the, the, the people that, that are programming the anti-malware solutions are making about 48,000 US and the people who are actually writing the malicious code are making almost a million. That is part of the problem. That is the problem. Now think about if RSA was paying their code writers a million a year to write anti malware solutions. I think we'd have a lot better uh, anti-malware solutions out there. I know I'd be submitting my application to these guys straight away. Okay, uh, a lot of money we made, we know that. These are, these are just rules of the game that there is a lot of money at stake. And of course, we've also talked about many times in these webinars to understand the explosion and attack. You need to understand the, com the commoditization, the commercialization of all hacking, but especially, especially ransomware. This is big business. These 90 organized ransomware groups make their money and also make their money in providing ransomware as a service. All right, a subscription service, and this has allowed free agents to enter, free agents with low skills capability and reaping high rewards. So suddenly everybody and their brother is out there with ransomware. And that we have to understand, the difference between an organized ransomware uh, attack uh, threat actor and a free agent, some kid who's just downloaded our uh, ransomware as a service package. But that package includes, because it's a business, that package includes, here's terms and conditions for its use. Here's the code of conduct. Here's how you can use it and how not to use it. Here's, they'll, they'll set up and, and, and give you your first 1,000 targets. And you have a problem, give us a call 24-7. We'll help you walk it through it to make sure that ransomware works against your target. It's a business. These criminal businesses provide service level agreements all the way through to customer star reviews. Everything, anything and everything, a high tech Silicon Valley company would roll out for a new product. It's business. And in any business, customer service and satisfaction is a rule. Just because the business is cybercrime doesn't, doesn't exempt them from, from this rule. In fact, they've embraced it.
It's a well-structured, self-policed industry with buyers and sellers, constant re reporting on who's the best person to get it from, very competitive. All right, so the second rule I want to get across to you is it's, it is a business. It's your business against their business. You need to understand this th threat attack, um, this attack, sorry, threat actor, as a business. It's the business of hacking. Here's, this is the point. You're in direct competition with another business for your data. You need to think that and not think about it as, you know, some kid sitting in his basement somewhere, you know, uh, in, in, in um, the United States you know, uh, attacking your business. But an organized cyber criminal organization that targets your business has all the resources, has more resources than your business. But we don't see these threat actors. We see them as individuals and not as organized businesses. Okay, again, my point is you need to see them for, we need to see them for what they are, our competition and treat them accordingly. All right, just another point on, we all know how, how, to ransom, how does ransomware enter a system? All right, this is essential that we, we continually remind ourselves that it can be downloaded, it could be from a, a website, it could be in an email, it could be downloaded in a flash drive. Uh, uh, the, we have to understand the attack vectors, the paths that malware takes to infect the target systems. These are the only, these, these are the main ones that we need to recognize to develop any strategy to be effective. But here, here's one I promise you that you're neglecting. I know you're neglecting it. You know you're neglecting it. IoT. Yeah, I, Rich, I know. IoT, sure, sure, but I don't see it. Uh, uh, you don't see it because you're not looking. We have a habit in this industry, all right, to neglect security in technology until it's too late. Security is a bolt-on. Always had in our industry, in technology, technology first, security second. Always has been, always will be. Remember Wi-Fi, remember cloud, it's technology first, security second. I promise you, if you want to get ahead of this, this, this problem, you need to start thinking about the attack vectors provided by your IoT devices. If you don't see IoT as the next ransomware attack vectors, you really shouldn't be working in this industry. And we're, per we're perpetuating the same problems we always do. Your card access systems, your biometrics, your fire life safety systems. Do you not see this as a real target for ransomware attack uh, threat actors? And of course, this is the one that, uh, this is an attack vector we should all have seen coming. And this is not even social engineering. This is, this is a, 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 a threat actor contacting an employee of the company saying, I'll give you 40% of the take. Now, given that the average ransomware payment is now, what, 570,000 uh, pounds, that's about a quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million dollars for downloading an application. You need to pay attention to this threat vector. This will be the unseen. This will be our next insider threat buzz. So oh, we forgot about that. We, you know, we forgot. You know, we're only uh, uh, paying our employees, you know, 50 grand. They can make a quarter of a million for just downloading an application. IoT and insider threat attached to the ransomware will be our next headache. And it, it is natural as you, if you look at the evolution of what we've been through in the last 20 years. Okay, uh, next I wanna talk about the anatomy of attack, just in terms of rules of the game, right? Let's look at the anatomy of a typical attack. We know this already, but it's important we constantly keep in, that we keep in mind the attack vectors where does ransomware come in to our systems? By and large, everybody, you know, the, the evidence is clear. This is 90% of the attack, uh, the ransomware attacks are just started by phishing emails. Step one, step two, step three, six, six and you're out. Okay, so we know this, we got this, but and this is important to understand because the, if you understand the attack vectors, then you map these to, do I have controls in these attack vectors? Can I, can I spot a phishing email? Can I spot the egress of data? Okay, when you start to devise, are my controls fit for purpose? You're gonna use this as a map, the, the, the anatomy of a typical ransomware attack. This is your map for, for, to, to what security controls do I need and where. But all malware, all malware is programmed to exploit known vulnerabilities. Every single bit of ransomware out there 
is programmed to exploit a known vulnerability. So something very important is you need to concentrate on where's my initial access vulnerabilities. All right, this is this is this is critical. All ransomware needs a security vulnerability to exploit in order to enter, infect, and ex exfiltrate. These are just common vulnerabilities and exposures, CVEs. You all know these, these are listed commonly. These are security vulnerabilities associated with the products and services we deploy on our systems. Take a look at this. They're VPNs, they're Microsoft, they're firewalls. You know, Microsoft Azure to, to Fortinet uh, and Sophos. Now look at this list. These are 43 CVEs associated with 18 products that are responsible for over 95% of ransomware infections in the last five years. Google it. These common vulnerabilities are responsible for 95% of the ransomware attacks we've seen in the last five years. So what is it? What am I telling you? I'm telling you that you fix these, you patch these vulnerabilities and you shut down the attack vectors uh, that 95% of the malware we've known in the last five years takes to infect your systems. This is not rocket science. Ransomware needs to exploit the vulnerabilities. You close down the vulnerabilities, there is no ransomware attack. And look at these, look at these vulnerabilities, how many are actually associated with products and services that you and I depend on to protect our systems. Do you do recognize, you see the irony there? Okay, so you, shut, you, you understand the attack vectors and understand that they, in each attack vector, there are initial access vulnerabilities. You shut these down, and you can download this list and go through this list one by one, where it applies to you, where it doesn't. And you're already closing down attack vectors that ransomware needs to infect your system. So you got to know what I call rule number three, know the pitch, understand the attack vectors, the points of entry for ransomware. You understand where to put your focus and the focus of your strategy. Okay, so that's just rules of the game. Let's go through what I call then our essential planes. All right, we set the scene. Now, what does a ransomware prevention strategy actually look like? It's got five components, right? Simple. Your strategy should have five basic components to identify, to protect, to detect, respond, and recover. Does this look familiar? Of course, it's the NIST cybersecurity framework. Why? Because it works. Because it works. You've got a strategy for ransomware that has these five components in it, and let's go through each five, but to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. A process behind each. And you're gonna have an effective strategy. But the first, very first thing you wanna do is identify. There are three things you need to identify. First of all, where would a ransomware attack really hurt my business? It's called a business impact assessment. You've, it's been around forever. We've all done them. If you haven't done them, you don't understand. You haven't identified the assets that if interrupted could significantly harm your business because that's what you want to hold for ransom. Okay, where, so your objective is where would a ransomware uh, uh, infection hurt us? Where would the pain be felt? What do I need to protect, right? Okay, second thing you want to do is what are the controls that I have I'm, I'm counting on to stop, uh, you know, stop an attack and protect these assets. So it's an assessment of the actual controls. What do I have to protect? What controls am I uh, counting on to protect it? And then the third one is, 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 of course, the most importantly, you know, does the, you have to identify if the business understands these two, what do I have and what, what am I counting on to protect it? That the, that the business understands the threat of ransomware and the impact of ransomware. So you can, without that, you won't have a strategy. Do the asset owners understand what's gonna happen if they suddenly couldn't get access to their ass information assets? Does the business understand that if this were out tomorrow, what would be the impact on the business? So first play, identify the assets, the controls you're counting on, and if the business understands the threat. Second play, I'm going to call it you know, the easy one. This, this is easy. Determine if the controls you have in place now, do they work? Are they fit for purpose? So, you know, include all of your, you know, and these could just be 
it, when we're talking about if you're counting on network segmentation to keep your information assets out of harm's way, if you're talking about specific uh, uh, isolation or, or anti-malware or active directory permission, uh, all of these things, and you can easily test these the next time you do a pen test. Give this to your pen tester and say, can you get unauthorized access to my information assets? All right, the whole objective is, are the current controls, are the controls you're currently relying on, are they fit for purpose? Are they going to keep you out of harm's way in the event of an attack? So it's an actual assessment of the controls. Identify them and then assess them and, and make sure that they work. All right, next you want to verify that you can identify and respond to an attack. All right, to do this, now we're talking about you have to apply that ransomware workflow to your controls. You have to understand, this is why you have to understand how ransomware comes in and how it affects. And if you're sitting at those choke, choke points, that you can actually identify attack. You can identify a phishing email. You can identify someone giving, you know, trying net user commands or password cracking tools or, you know, or encrypting data or, or exfiltrating data. Again, same thing. You can have this done in your next pen test. Give this to a pen tester to, to provide. You know, you can actually download simulated ransomware to see if your anti-malware solution, A, identifies it, B, stops it. It's commercially available now. And your pen testing provider should be able to do this. So verify that A, you could detect an attack by matching an attack workflow up against your controls and seeing how quickly does it trigger an alarm for us. If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound to this business? Do I have the controls necessary to, to identify and respond to it? The point is that your strategy needs this ability to be able to detect an attack, because if you can't detect it, then you can't defend, about, defend it. You must be able to then, once you've identified it, be able to respond to it. All right, this is, this is very common sense. This is all about testing my incident identification and response plans. Does my incident response plans work? All right, how quickly can I respond to something? All right, and do my plans work? My incident response plans work? And do I have the right people with the right skill set to, to, to isolate the event, to remove the event? It should be very common sense. It's making sure your incident response plan works. And the final component of your strategy is, is you know, hey, can I, can I bounce back? testing your business continuity, your disaster recovery uh, programs, making sure that they're, they're verified that they're fit for purpose, and of course, filling in where they're not. How quickly can we bounce back from an attack? You have to know, is it a day, is it a week, is it a minute, is it an hour? But that, that simple five-part strategy, all right? Identifying where an attack would really hurt your business, right? What controls that you're counting on to protect your business, you know, and does the business understand the threat? And then to be, you know, to it, it's your strategy has to have a component of protection by testing your existing controls to confirm they are protecting you. And, and again, you can do this through, through your next pen test. You should have the ability to detect and verify if and how you can detect a ransomware attack. Clients call me and say, Richard, we don't know how we'd stand. I said, have you tested yourself? Said, well, that's a, that's a great idea. And then respond how quick, how, verify how quickly you can respond to an attack, your incident response plans work, and you have the resources to deal with it. And finally, that you can recover, right? You've got business, you've got backups, you've got business continuity, disaster plans that are fit for purpose. They actually work. They actually work. The reason ransomware is reaping such havoc on our industry is we have plans, but do they work? When's the last time, I, I, I'd love to ask a client is that, when is the last time you tested your incident response, business continuity and disaster recovery plans? Do they work? And who does that? And if you do, good on you. If you don't, you'll find that out the next ransomware. But these are the components of a very effective defensive strategy. Then there's, you know, you want quick wins. There's absolutely quick wins. You know, we talked about, this is almost like a, you know, all, there's basic processes and security sysadmin that you should already be doing best practices. 
that, you know, from identifying what, you know, conducting BIAs annually to identify that you, you understand where your, your critical information assets and, and how vulnerable they are, you know, how your, 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 the, the efficacy of the controls you've got, you're counting on to protect these assets, making sure you have multiple levels of anti-malware, uh, that you've got strong passwords, you know, you're patching your updates. This is all, this is one-on-one sysadmin stuff we all should be doing. But you combine that with this, addressing, you know, fixing, looking at your system for these 43 common vulnerability ex exploits that are associated with 18 products and responsible for over 95% of the ransomware uh, uh, infections in the last five years, and you will reduce your risk of ransomware by 95%. Uh, Rich, can I, can I ask a question here? Because yes, sir. Not come in, and it's it's exactly around this CVE. Uh, Binda actually asked a question: With ever more complex systems and code, will there ever be no CVEs? And will forcing companies to <laughs> more thoroughly before GA resolves them? Um, they're creating situations before they need to get their ROA as quickly as possible. So it's a, a fairly good question. On that. That's a question near and dear to my heart. Um, you can tell by my tone and my tone and tenor that I don't look at, first of all, look at these CVEs. They are associated with the bulk of them, 18 products. You and I, we all buy these products to protect our systems. These are VPNs and firewalls. So what, what the question seems to beg the, you know, beg the question is, why aren't our vendors giving us better products? Why are our vendors allowing vulnerabilities in products that we are deploying to protect our systems that can be exploited to, uh, uh, to exfiltrate data and to download ransomware? So I, 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 I really don't think yeah, we will never see, you know, there is no security by design. We, we're all, I, I don't know about you, but my gray hair, part of my gray hair is coming to terms with we have not put our arms around security by design. We will continue to write code that has vulnerabilities. We will continue to write, you know, to manufacture products that have vulnerabilities in it. But I, I'm, I'm tough on, I think we should be tougher on our industry. How is it that a manufacturer, like a firewall, can manufacture a firewall with a zero day vulnerability, an unknown unknown in it? That becomes an exploitable vulnerability that is exploited for a, by a ransomware threat actor and causes pay, pain. I, I don't get that. How can a manufacturer of a security product have a, any vulnerability in it without knowing it? Security is their business. It's my business. And if I were and if you're manufacturing a product that has vulnerabilities in it, it I, I would suggest it's not fit for, for, for the market. But the question is a good one. And it's the question is what we should be asking. How is it that we continue to, to manufacture products with vulnerabilities in them? It's because we fail to understand the, the payoff for secure, for secure by design. We're not writing secure code. Why is that? I don't have an answer for that. And so my hair is gray. And uh, I, I, I wonder about, you know, when will it take for us to see this is our problem? This is our problem. We continue to have more, more and more software that has vulnerabilities in it that will always be exploitable. These are the current ones. And yes, I'm making a point here that these are the current CDs, just 43. But if you, if you went through your business and addressed each one of these and said, apply, don't apply. And if they apply, either got rid of, either fixed it, patched it, or got rid of it, you would reduce your threat of ransomware by 95%. I think that's significant. And I think that's not, that's something we all should be talking about in a very loud voice. Okay. Yeah, I made my point that I, <laughs> I beat that to death. Sorry, Jonathan, please uh, let me introduce, uh, uh, that's my two pence. Let me now introduce Jonathan Armstrong and ask him to give us some of his wisdom on, uh, Jonathan, please enlighten us. What are some of the legal issues we need to consider when it comes to ransomware? Uh, thanks, Rich. And, uh, Nice to speak to you all. I think about 10 years ago, I came to speak to the BCS London branch and it was uh, uh, an upstairs room off, uh, off the Strand, I think. So thanks for the second invite back. As I remember it, uh, I think we just launched our book and I think the Q&A went on for about an hour. So, um, so I've already seen some great questions in the, in the chat and thanks for those. I'm gonna try and pick some of those up. And Rich, it, it's, it's no burden to return the compliment. Obviously I've enjoyed our chat and, I, and as somebody from the North of England, I do 
value people who speak it like it is. And you've always been uh, that for me. I wish I'd have known 35 years ago that you knew about um, American football, though. So it's one amu mildly amusing story. When I was a kid, we had a keen student PE teacher who said, uh, next week, I'm going to teach you American football. You know, the north of England, we did not play American football. And my uncle lived in Buffalo. He'd sent me uh, a Buffalo Bills shirt. And I thought, I'll impress the new teacher. I'll turn up. I'm 11 years old or whatever. I'll turn up in my Buffalo Bills shirt. So what did he say? There's only one kid here with an American football shirt. He threw me the ball and said, your quarterback, do your first play. I had no clue. But almost to the point of today, that's why we prepare for ransomware attacks. We can either get thrown the ball and have to think of a strategy and run with it, or we can prepare in advance. And that's a key message, I think, with ransomware. The clients that we see that rehearse a ransomware attack and work out their plan in advance have materially better consequences across the board than those who don't. Those Absolutely. Who just, yeah, those who just turn up wearing the shirt without a plan don't do that well. <laughs> but, they, but they look good. You got to you got to wear the shirt. <laughs> That's true. So um, uh, if you can give me my first slide, I'm going to try and pick up some of the themes from Rich's talk, and I'm going to try and pick up some of the themes from the chat as well. So I think the first question, I think from Rachel, is should I pay a ransom whenever I receive a ransomware attack? Well, I think that's become an increasingly difficult question to answer. But as a general rule, your default setting should be no. And I'll talk a bit about default settings. And the reason for that is I think whenever you're in a crisis and ransomware for most organizations is a crisis, you have to look at your own default settings. What is my instinctive muscle memory reaction Sometimes you'll change that because there might be a circumstance when you have to alter that default setting. But as a general rule, your default setting on ransomware should be, I won't pay. There's a whole host of reasons for that. I've linked to an article in the chat. But bear in mind that because we are at a state of war, and because some of the players are siding with people in that war, as, as Richard said, the Conti gang notably going on the side of Putin, anonymous uh, siding with Ukraine, the sanctions regime has increased. And that's not just the sanctions regime that's biting on threat actors. And by the way, it does. And again, I won't go into all of them, but there are US sanctions, for example, against ransomware players and against cryptocurrency exchanges that are often used to pass the money from the good guys to the bad guys. And at the same time, a, a, a large number of Russian banks who you'd expect to see somewhere in that transaction are sanctioned as well. So the jeopardy, if you like, if you pay ransomware, has increased in the last four, five, six weeks. And your chances of being hit by ransomware have also increased because of world events. And your chances of uh, overstepping the mark, whether that be with sanctions or whether that potentially be with terrorist financing laws, are also increased as well. And you might say, well, how on earth are Russian hackers, for example, going to target little old me? And I'd say, you know, go back to, uh, if you Google Keith Chegwin uh, uh, China ransomware attack, you'll see how people suffer collateral damage in times of war. Keith Chegwin, uh, many of you will remember him from Cheggers Plays Pop. He ran a site called Cheggers Bedroom, where he would do live chats uh, from his bedroom on a diverse range of topics. 
I, I tuned in for the purposes of research. This is maybe 11 years ago. He was talking about reform of the DVLA vehicle tax license system. Not a topic I'd associated with Keith Chagrin, but there we go. But he was attacked by nation state players because a lot of the people who were uh, tuning in to his site had US IP addresses and somebody made the quantum limp, uh, leap from thinking lots of IP addresses. Therefore, Chegwin is an agent of the US state. He probably is CIA or FBI. So let's take his website down. So the threshold, the sanity threshold, whenever you're in uh, uh, times of war like this is not high. So as a result, I think it's always really difficult to pay ransomware, particularly at the moment, particularly in times of conflict, because attribution is always hard. Gangs will pretend to be other gangs. And there's a whole host of other reasons why you'd want to explore a no pay uh, option first. That it might include availability of decrypt keys. And again, Rich, you've talked about Conti. Conti are fighting amongst themselves at the moment. And as a result, some decrypt keys have become available, which might mean that you don't have to pay, that you can uh, try and decrypt. The other thing I'd say about ransomware is from my experience and from all the stats you read, again, there are links in the article, you will not get full recovery if you pay ransomware. What, some of the most difficult discussions that we have, and perhaps I should have explained this at the start, Cordry, we're a specialist law firm. We do three things around uh, this area. We only do technology and compliance work. We do risk prevention, so that's policies and procedures. We do training, things like data breach academies to try and get people uh, battle ready for ransomware and other uh, uh, breaches. And we do responses, so that might be uh, responding to potential litigants, might be responding to regulators, might be sitting with boards when they've had a ransomware attack and working out their response. In most of the ransomware incidents I've been uh, involved with, there is somebody pretty senior in the business who wants to write a check. Sometimes there's an insurer who wants to write the check. But oftentimes you have to resist that. And partly, as I say, it's because of these legal reasons around sanctions, partly because of decryption availability, but partly because it isn't a silver bullet. If you look at the stats from the attack on the Irish Health Service, for example, they're given a decryption key but it's still thousands of man hours uh, to recover. So the first question I think from uh, Rachel, should I pay, as I say, default setting no. Next slide, Rich. Um, so if you are involved in ransomware, who's looking over your shoulder and what are the likely effects? Well, I think the first thing to consider is litigation. Again, that's somewhere where the environment, I think, has changed in the last 18 months, two years. I have a working assumption that a lot of law firms who were doing slips and trips, accident claims, haven't had those type of claims during lockdown because people haven't had road accidents. They haven't tripped over on the yogurt in Asda. And as a result, they need another thing to feed the litigation machine. And quite often, the other thing is post ransomware litigation. We've seen it in, uh, in, in, in our practice where we had a client with a ransomware attack from Revil. Revil post uh, proof of concept, if you like, uh, an amount of the data that they've exfiltrated onto a website called The Happy Blog. Within 24 hours of our client being mentioned on The Happy Blog, a firm of lawyers had set up a dedicated portal to receive claims uh, from this organization. In, if you look at cases like uh, British Airways, where it's supplier breach, I think it's 72 hours from notification of incident to affected people to the letter before action being dropped on their door. Class action lawyers work weekends, so you will have to as well. And you'll have to work out your litigation strategy in advance if possible, and if not, pretty quickly. So litigation 
is a very realistic prospect. Without going into all of the details, there's a short film on our YouTube channel if you want more. There are some helpful cases, both in the UK, in Germany, in the Netherlands, that are trying to reduce the flow of post-breach litigation, but we're still seeing these claims across our desk. And to answer Ian's question, insurance is not the answer to this, in part because it's harder to get insurance, and in part because insurers will increasingly rely on something called a war exclusion clause. So if you have an attack by Conti, given that Conti have declared themselves to be an arm of the Russian army in advancing Putin's aims, I, I personally think it is highly unlikely that an insurer will cover that because insurers generally don't cover acts of war. There's some litigation in the US over it. One of the cases has recently been decided. There's another to come soon. But what we do know is that as a result of these cases, nearly every insurer has changed its war exclusion clause. Uh, Lloyd's, I think, changed its clauses in 2019. And we also know that the cyber insurance market has hardened. So litigation is a realistic prospect. And to answer Ian's question, insurance is likely to, unlikely to pick up the tab for that. Obviously, oh, Sorry, yes, John, sorry I, think, I had two points. One is I wanted to let you know I, I wrote down class action lawyers work weekends. That's that's invaluable for me. And two <laughs> is, you know, the insurance industry themselves are, are, are a target that threat actors are hacking into uh, yeah. insurers to understand who has a policy and for how much they'll pay, uh, they're covered. And it's a, essentially a target list. And I'm sorry if I if you were about to say that, but I, I didn't want to move on without saying insurance is, is literally uh, they're they're losing a list of customers who have policies who have the exact uh, you know how much they're paying. So when we, when they hit them for ransomware, it's the exact amount their insurers will pay. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, and, and I think as I say, we've we've seen definitely a change of attitude from insurers. One insurer particularly was writing a lot of policies and, and, and some of our clients have struggled to get them to honor their promise when they have been breached. The other thing that you'll need to consider, or, or the second thing you'll need to consider is regulatory action. Again, that environment has changed in the last uh, year or so, I'd think. Um, uh, so to answer somebody else's question, if you have a ransomware incident, you're probably going to have to report that to a data protection regulator. That will be the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK. If you also have EU operations, additionally, you're now going to have to tell a regulator in the EU, and you may have to tell regulators in other jurisdictions, the US, for example, depending on your footprint. But we've definitely seen regulators get much better at dealing with ransomware. Uh, and that's true of the UK regulator. It's true of the Australian regulator, from my experience, where previously, if you said you had a ransomware attack, you might get a acknowledgement and you might get the regulator then saying, I don't know, maybe six weeks later, OK, tell us a bit more about the attack. What happens now in the last, I would say, 12 months or so, is many regulators have a ransomware questionnaire. I think they have had some uh, upskilling from other government agencies, very direct questions, very to the point, you can expect follow up in 48 hours. So when you go to a regulator, and as a reminder, if it's a GDPR report, 72 hours from uh, the breach, then you can expect you to have to report within that 72 hours, and then a follow up report within, say, 48 hours. I'd plan for that. And obviously, Ransomware is super difficult from my experience. That first 72 hours goes really quickly. Oftentimes, the clock's already started running. You know, you've got locked machines, somebody's looking for another explanation, then they tell the CISO, uh, whatever that might be. Quite often, 
by the time external counsel are involved, sometimes it's day two, you've got a short window to report, and nearly always you haven't got full facts. So quite often you're having to report piecemeal, and as I say, deal with extra requests from regulators. Uh, that's okay, that's allowable under the GDPR regime, but obviously the more organized you can be, the more information you can give, the more likely you are able, you're gonna be able to persuade a regulator that this was sort of chance that hit you rather than you being rubbish about everything. And remember that the potential fines are high and enforcement is much greater than it used to be. Enforcement in terms of GDPR fines currently stands at around about 1.4 billion euros. Uh, I, I checked those figures uh, this morning. And of that, there is about 1.1 billion last year. This year has already got off to a, a big start. So fines are very likely. You might also have disclosure obligations in contracts, uh, particularly if you are a government contractor, you might have obligations to tell people, particularly if you supply data related services to other people. Uh, you might have liability to those third parties as well. And you might also have to deal with uh, DSARs, data subject requests under GDPR. What commonly happens, particularly with an employee data breach, is if you tell one employee or a few employees, they tell co-workers, co-workers ask the question, if they don't get a satisfactory answer, they start to make subject access requests under GDPR. And we're also seeing the class action lawyers get very good at making subject access requests. So if you've had a breach, you need to have uh, a, a DSAR strategy as well. And by the way, uh, normally, if you've had a breach, a regulator will may or may not fine you, but will almost certainly, in my experience, recommend a set of remedial me measures. One of the standard remedial measures from the ICO is to put in place a system of being able to read, uh, to deal with uh, SARs uh, really quickly. Um, next slide. I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna speed up a bit. Uh, in the event of a breach, so when you have a breach, I would say when, not if, breaches are inevitable, however good you are, partly because of those common exploits that Richard's talked about, but partly because we don't have perimeters anymore. We have employees, we have subcontractors, we have other people who process data on our behalf. You know, if you look at some of the big breaches like the Kronos breach before Christmas, one contractor can be breached and affect 500 of the Fortune 1000. And as Rich says, a lot of intelligence goes into this. These gangs behave like corporations. They might franchise one particular uh, contractor to somebody or one particular industry, and they are tough adversaries. So when you have a breach, privilege is key. And that's obviously a legal concept, but because the litigation risk is higher, you need to do what you can to protect the information that you have. You want to try and keep that within the business wherever possible. And legal privilege is one of the ways of doing that. And as a general rule, the safest route is normally to get good outside lawyers and get them to commission any external assistance you need. You'll need to get the right team together. If you can think of the team in advance and rehearse them, even better. That right team is going to include internal people. So it might be PR people. Obviously, it's people from the CISO's office. Maybe it's people from your legal team if you have an in-house legal department who know this stuff. Maybe it's people from HR if it's going to be uh, employees affected. Maybe it's people from your marketing team if it's going to be customers affected. Get that team together. Rehearse you're gonna need some external people as well. Even the best organizations need an external tech specialist. That might be somebody like, uh, like Rich and his team. Uh, you'll need to consider approaches to law enforcement. Law enforcement have got some great resources 
really helpful in some jurisdictions with ransomware, particularly willing to share intelligence if they get the right approach and try and rehearse these teams and try and get those external people under a, a, under a proper legal privilege agreement, which might mean that you don't have to disclose whatever they've said it, uh, when, the, uh, when the class action comes. Uh, plan properly. And as I've said, that's going to include rehearsals, similar to a fire. We all sort of practice fire evacuations when we're back in the office, not because we expect the fire to happen, but we want to be prepared for when it does. And the strategy is very similar. Rehearse getting out of the building and have a simple sheet like the sheets you have on the back of a hotel door telling people what the simple plan is. The best plans are the shortest. The IT team, the response team, have normally got a bigger plan. But the plan for employees should be something like, if you see something unusual, report it ASAP too. Uh, as I've said before, claims come quickly. And I would say this, wouldn't I? Uh, not all uh, lawyers are experts in this space. This isn't time to pay for somebody's learning curve. You haven't got time to pay for somebody to get up to speed in this area. So you'll need to uh, use lawyers who know this space. Next slide, Rich, if you will. Uh, we talked a little bit about reporting requirements, and I know there were some questions on that on the chat. Most ransomware will be reportable. We probably haven't got time to go into the exact thresholds unless there's a, a question and people want to ask about that. But most ransomware will be reportable. Firstly, because most of the attacks we see include exfiltration. So people taking data from the system normally to extract money from you, to show you a piece of it, to show that they're serious. If there's any exfiltration, that will almost certainly be reportable. But you can also have what's called availability breaches, where there's no exfiltration or no evidence of exfiltration, but the data has been unavailable for a period of time. Um, the attacks on health trusts around the Humberside area will be an example of an unavailability breach. The data, it was thought, hadn't moved. But because the clinicians couldn't access the data, they couldn't do planned operations. That is also a data breach in GDPR terms, also has to be reportable. When does the time start? Well, with ransomware, it's normally relatively easy in that uh, uh, the, uh, you, you're probably going to need to start with the time when the screens were locked. But then you might need to go back earlier to look for evidence of exfiltration or the payload. As Rich says, uh, payloads come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. From my experience, I relatively get, uh, I relatively rarely get good data on what the payload was. Uh, oftentimes people can tell me the type of encryption, they can roughly attribute it footprint back to gang, but, uh, but, but the time when the attack took place is often difficult, particularly because a lot of these attacks lay dormant on the system and the exploit might be sold from one gang to another. So I think you've always got to be conservative and run your 72 hours uh, as at, at the very latest from when you knew. But I think we're going to see cases with regulators when they say, look, you knew of the attack at six o'clock on Tuesday, but that's only because your systems are rubbish. You should have known of the attack three weeks ago, and you don't get any regulatory credit for having rubbish systems. And potentially then you're facing two fines, one for having the ransomware and two for a failure to have what are called TOMS, adequate technical and organizational measures, which are required by GDPR. So as well as telling regulators, you may need to tell victims. There's a slightly different balancing test under GDPR. It's not inevitable that you have to tell victims, but you might want to. And that's why you need marketing and PR uh, expertise. And again, if we've time in the q and I could give you some techniques for good ways to tell victims that we've come across. You might have additional reporting obligations. So that might be under uh, PICA, which is a... a uh, um, a different non-GDPR set of rules, a different directive that'll apply to telecoms, for example. Uh, 
There's the NIST directive and then NIST 2. Uh, NIST 2 isn't in yet, but a, but a directive which extends reporting obligations to different organizations. And PICA, NIST and NIST 2 obligations apply whether or not personal data has gone from the system. So if you're in any type of regulated industry, look at PICA, NIST, NIST 2. If you were to go to the Cordry website, type in NIST, you'll get the full list of the organizations that are currently in NIST and are likely to be in NIST 2. There might be sector specific rules as well, uh, SCA rules, for example. And as I've said earlier, regulators are much more thorough in 2021 than they were in 2020. Next slide, nurse. So some things that you might not know. Well, first of all, the strategy whenever you report, if you want a good regulatory outcome, is to start self-learning immediately. So our strategy usually when we make a report is to look at what regulators have ordered with similar ransomware attacks in the past. And we keep a big uh, database and we try and match this ransomware attack is similar to this one. And we know that regulators said that. And the more of that list that you can volunteer when you make the report, the better the regulatory outcome is likely to be. Regulators like people to self-reflect. So for example, <coughs> in one of those rare cases where we could find the attack vector, we found that the attack was a phishing attack on a particular individual in a particular team. So we said to the regulator, we have taken that team offline as soon as we worked out it was them. They were off the system. We then did training, and a colleague and I did training at sort of 7.30 a.m. the next morning. They had mandatory training on phishing and the effects of phishing. They all confirmed they defended the, uh, attended the training. Somebody went round. It was a small team. Asked them a couple of questions. If they answered the questions correctly, they'd listened to the training. They were allowed online again. And we said that to the regulator. We said we've managed to identify the attack vector. We, tr we took them offline, we trained the individuals, then they came back online again. And regulators like that. They like that sort of self-awareness. So the key often is working out what a regulator is gonna order you to do and volunteer to do that instead. As I've said earlier, have a litigation strategy. Litigation is inevitable. I've talked about the latency of attacks. I've talked a bit about sanctions. And as Rich has said, it's wrong to regard these gangs as fixed items. They're a little bit like Tupperware parties, if people remember Tupperware parties. There's one product, in this case, the exploit or the ransomware, and one group producing the product, then a load of home groups that are doing the virtual knocking on the door to try and sell that product. And there's like a commission system going back, as Rich said, sometimes to the individual who's delivered the exploit, sometimes different commissions to people who've written the phishing email, people who are the money mules, people who are trying to get around a cryptocurrency exchange regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, it's very hard to know who's involved if you make a payment. So sanctions prosecutions are a real possibility. I've talked briefly about criminal offences already, uh, terrorist finance, et cetera. I've talked a bit about decryption and how that's not guaranteed. One thing I want to spend a little bit of time on, two or three minutes, is train for today's attacks. Too many people, in my experience, buy phishing training, particularly on price. Stop doing that. We don't need to tell people about Nigerian astronauts trapped on Russian space stations. We don't need to train people on yesterday's risks. We need to train people on today's risks. And in my view, any training that is more than six weeks old probably isn't going to hit the mark. Because as I've said, without exaggeration, we are at a time of war and physical wars spill over into cyberspace within 24 hours. So the risks are different and we need to train people for those different risks. Um, and I know that's a tough ask, but we just have to do that. Like 
that can be micro training. It can be a standard sort of training course that we're refreshing by telling people about risks regularly. I personally prefer that. I think it's more effective. It's often more easier to persuade a regulator if you've got uh, different touch elements of training rather than one big uh, annual event. Um, but one of the other risks that we have to uh, take into account is homeworking as well. And I think when people are in the office, they speak to a co-worker, let's call her Clever Susan, and you say, Susan, this looks a bit fishy to me. Take a look at it. And Susan said, don't click on that link. Don't visit that website. Don't do this. Don't do that. We've missed our Clever Susan during lockdown. We miss that with hybrid working. So that has to be a key factor in any training that we do. And also, we have to invest in the process, partly because that helps us mitigate the risk of attacks, partly because it will help us identify risk, as Richard said, but partly because stakeholders demand it as well. Um, one of the uh, uh, other changes that we've seen across our desk in the past two years or so is regulators asking uh, really tough questions, but also potential customers, potential acquirers, potential investors. A number of them have been spooked by the um, Marriott fine, uh, where Marriott were fined for um, a, a data breach in Starwood, an entity that it had acquired. And we're definitely seeing many more questions, as I said, from investors, stakeholders, etc. So investing in the process is important not only to prevent attacks, but also because it goes to the heart of value. That is part of the value of your business. And to protect your business, then you'll need to, um, uh, th then you'll need to have a proper strategy as well. So I think, Rich, we had a question from Hervin asking if he could leave. I think he's allowed to leave if he doesn't have oh, any questions. No. Nobody leaves until it's over. I thought we all agree on that. <laughs> Uh, we uh, we did. We've got a couple of questions. I thought uh, we would just uh, uh, finish this up and then get right back into the questions. In fact, I'd like to go back through the uh, the attack anatomy because a couple of questions were, how does this specifically happen? And I I I. I, I may have glossed over that, but I wanted to give that a specific example. But I'm glad you ended on invest in process, because if there is a civil bullet, you know, certainly from my perspective, in terms of the roll up your sleeves, do this as admin, you know, address the CVEs, uh, you know, test your plans, test, you know, it's process, process, process. This isn't a product solution. This is going to be a process solution. And also, as you pointed out, in the event that you have a problem, at the end of the day, you're going to have to prove that you had a process. You're going to have to prove due diligence, whether that be to a regular or to, to a client or, or to your business or to an insurer, you're going to have to say, well, this is what we did do to, to reduce the risk of ransomware. And that's going to have to stand up. Um, so process is, is both your best defense and as well as your best friend in the event of, uh, in the event of a problem. Um, we did end, uh, Jonathan, and Jonathan's done a really good uh, uh, article uh, just recently. Jonathan, if you want to just introduce us what they could find on this. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, this is a blog uh, I just did. Uh, thanks for including that uh, last Monday on how war changes things like ransomware. So it's only a couple of pages long, but uh, you're welcome to read it and hopefully I, some thoughts that are interesting. I thought it was worth not only is it current, but it's also this cause and effect in terms of liability and, and compliance issue that I thought was was very contemporary because of because of uh, the Ukraine issue, but also just uh, it's that kind of insight that you know that needs you need to connect the dots to current events, uh, current uh, current events. Current events, sorry. Um, let me just, just a couple of things to say here. So in, in terms of the takeaways that I wanted to make sure that we all had, and then Jonathan, if you had any thoughts, but you know, I, I, I wanted to make it a point that this is a, this is a us versus them in terms of you need to understand the threat vector as a business. All right, and, and very few of my clients get that, get that this business is resourced, it's organized, it's got skills, it's got capabilities, it's highly motivated. They have their, the, the actors are well paid uh, and reap huge benefits, bigger than our the benefits that you and I reap in our businesses, but it's your business against them. And I think if you adopt that perspective, you'll have a, a completely different approach to how you develop a strategy. 
you know, malware problems, yes, you know, they, they, they do require products, but, uh, uh, you know, let's test our products and let's, let's start asking more of our product ven uh, vendors. If you understand the anatomy of a malware attack, these attack like there's the points of entry, you understand then where to focus your controls. Okay, and that kind of devil is the detail, yeah, is where do I put my controls and are my controls fit for purpose? And as Jonathan says, you just cannot underestimate your legal, in, the illegal impacts, not just the financial impact, but the legal impacts of, uh, of a ransomware attack. Um, you know, a good strategy pro pro combines this process and product approach, but we should be, you know, if we're asking more for our vendors and we, and I, I wanted to make this point of 43 CDs associated with 95% of the ransomware attacks, that's a process approach. That's a process problem solved. If you mm. can stay on top of that, I did, uh, Jonathan. We uh, uh, so we've got some we've got some times for uh, for some questions, and we've uh, what I what I did want to do is run through and make sure that uh, just to go over a couple slides. Somebody's asked for a specific uh, current. You know, we, we put the slide up. Yeah. This is this is an actual attack? This is actually the blueprint for ninety percent of the attacks out there. They're sent. Phishing emails are sent. A user see, sees it and clicks on that link and executes a malware payload. Okay, and that payload then then finds a server to download itself on. That payload can be can be very simple or very complex. It depends on the target and what they're after. Do, do they need to search your network to find a specific target to lock down or do they just wanna lock down everything that comes into play? Okay, but then the first thing that it does, once that communication sets up, the key exchanges between the payload, the malware and the attack uh, and the threat actor. Okay, and that key, once that's exchanged, that's what Jonathan's saying, and that's that's an encrypted exchange. So you, you may or may not know the exact time that the 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 target was encrypted. But then once that's done, then then it's all then it's it's over. Technically the attack is finished and it's about paying it to get that decryption key. But this is the blueprint of every I don't want to say every single attack, but you know, the majority of the attacks are this simple. That screenshot you see in second number five where files get encrypted and you that's an actual screenshot of a here's how you pay. And, and this is what 95% of the businesses out there experience, a phishing email. And yes, you know, we said that uh, let's, let's not forget that, you know, it can come in many forms from IoT to just downloading, you know, a, a, or a flash drive put from inside from an employee who's going to get a piece of this. But, you know, I, I, we, I purposely didn't go through to talk about what happened at so-and-so. Uh, I, I don't like to name or shame. You know, this is a very, very... A, a simple attack vector that you know that has these vectors sorry that has these attack paths technically follows this footprint and if you understand this is the anatomy of an attack you can look at your system and understand where where to put your controls rich i um i think this is exactly right from the attacks we see uh if i was finessing your slide which i shouldn't be doing on the hoof no no please uh, the this in more than half the attacks that we see, there's a step uh, between two and three, which is baddies try and take a shed load of data from the business. And the analogy I'd give you is sometimes our clients uh, don't understand that exfiltration piece. And in their head, they're thinking it's a little bit like a burglary where the attackers come in and they know what they're after, and they take it, and they take nothing else, and they leave. But from my experience, ransomware isn't like that. Why would they sit in your system working out whether they need it or not when they can almost as quickly take everything to their lockup back in some safe country and look through it in the lockup? So one of the things that I've seen change in the last three or four years is attempts to extract huge amounts of data and then an ability to sift that information. So yes. in, one, in one attack uh, we saw terabytes of data going out of the system, but presenting back to us 11 documents, I think, that were almost the most worrisome in the entire organization. Yep. The organization itself 
couldn't get to the 11 worrisome documents as quickly as the gang could identify them. And so that's an opportunity and a threat, isn't it? It's a threat because there's shed loads of data going, but it's potentially an opportunity because if you can file, fine tune your DLP system or fine tune some of your software solutions, you potentially can see the exfiltration spike ahead of the ransomware attack, is, is uh, the ransomware demand. That's exactly what I was going to say. And a lot of ransomware actors do not want to take on that risk of getting exfiltration identified because a lot of people can see data exfiltration attempts and logs and records and can automatic. That's, that's a, that's a tripwire that, that, that can be sent that most companies have. So uh, it depends on my, my answer was to be certain organized groups like Revil uh, didn't want to do that. Revil was commoditized hacking. They'll leave it on your systems. They'll lock it down. They don't need to exfiltrate it. It's no good to you until they unlock it. Now, the bigger, some of the, some very big clients, they like to bring out proof of proof of life and also send the fear of God into, into the victim to know what else was taken. If they have that, you know, it, it gives that, it, it, it gives that fear factor to be able to send a document in with your mail demanding ransom. By the way, here it is. Here's proof of life. What, what am I doing with the, your intellectual property? What am I doing with your client list if I didn't lock this down? So, so it is this blueprint is the commoditized blueprint hacking that, you know, that, that, that is favored in terms of volume, uh, very sophisticated attack with high payoffs, meaning with, with values of, of well over 5 million US uh, will absolutely do that. They'll, you know, exfiltrate as much data because then there's, there's two, like you said, there's also two ransoms, pay to unlock it and then pay us again that we don't release this publicly because we already have it. So, and that is as creative as the, the threat actor. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, anyway, I hope we, we have, but I can I, I just add one other thing Rich, yeah, of course. On, on your employee threat, because I think a number of people in the chat uh, were interested in that. Uh, there's a there's a really interesting case in the US that's going through the criminal courts. So we don't know too many details. But what seems to have happened there is disaffected employee in IT replicated a ransomware attack sent a ransomware demand, which the corporation paid. So he's an employee that's leaving the business. Uh, he's not getting a payoff. So he gets a payoff by replicating a ransomware attack. Yeah. I'm fairly sure I have seen sort of fake ransomware. Um, and I think that's one thing potentially that we're going to see more of in 2022, this sort of pseudo ransomware if you like whether that be from employees or whether it be from chancer gangs in eastern europe that can get some old software download it from the internet the encryption keys are available relatively low level ransomware demands i see with attacks like that um but but um i, I guess that is a similar pattern to the slide you've got there, but but the difficulty with, as you've said, this sort of ransomware as a service is that you don't need to be that good to run the scam, do you? No, exactly. I, a couple other things in terms of, you know, we just, about two weeks ago, we had a client who called in and said, I just got a phone call that was a ransomware that was, that was telling me, you know, get a piece of paper. Let me give you a URL. No, it, so they had no evidence that anything was encrypted on their data, but they got a ransomware phone call that, that went right directly to the MD and said, you don't know me. I've, I've looked at your system. I've downloaded. So it was, a, it was a verbal, it was a verbal threat. Now, so they called us to say, we can't find anything on our systems. But I mean, this is just your your Nigeria, you know, uh, yeah, Nigerian yeah. space, uh, uh, you know, astronaut uh, trapped in space. It's just a, a, a variation of the theme. They've actually got, you know, now you're picking up a phone call saying if you can extort, you know, a hundred thousand pounds, fifty thousand pounds from a small company, saying I, I, you know, I don't want to disrupt your data, but I will. Um, Anyway, a couple of questions we had, Jonathan. We don't have a lot of time left, and there were some a couple okay. of questions. Uh, one is, uh, let me say, okay, do ransomware? It, do you know if ransomware is? A, well, let me let me just jump up to the best one. What what is the? Is there a preferred time for an attack? 
Uh, and, and the question mm. was, will somebody lock down my system uh, on a Friday to make sure I don't have resources over the weekend? Okay, so first of all, as in this, I left this up to say, you know, usually it's a phishing email. Phishing emails come when people are, are not focused on work. Okay, so work from home aside, if you're in your office, you're gonna open up your mails and phishing uh, attackers know that. And attackers know the best time to get you to click on a link is during lunch when you're when you're browsing or uh, on a Friday afternoon before three hours, you know, you got some, some, some time, you take a little personal time, do some shopping, whatever. So phishing attacks in terms of getting somebody to download a payload are when people are least vigilant. However, now once you're in, that that encryption will take place on usually will take place after reconnaissance is done, which is more likely coming up to we'll wait to the weekend. So they want to make sure that if there's any fine tuning, they can get in and out and you don't have the resources. So it's a it's a two pronged thing. The phishing attack will absolutely come come, you know, during lunchtime or on a Friday afternoon. But in terms yeah. of actual encryption, that could be a step or two after mm -hmm. re reconnaissance and that might come in on a weekend. Um, Jonathan, how, here's one for you. Uh, let me read it word for word. Is the PRCR the amendment that was added to the Data Protection Act in the UK to form DPPEC? Question mark. Might not be speaking about this correctly, but I encountered the DPPEC before the PEC, and it sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, simple answer is, is not. Uh, to, to answer your question, Richard, uh, on, on timing first, <clears throat> more than 50% of the breaches we report, you have to report on a weekend. Sometimes mm. that's because people know about it on a Friday night. Sometimes US corporations tend to tidy their desks on a Friday night, but more than half the breaches we report, we report over a weekend. Um, as far as the Pika question is concerned, the simple answer is no. So the UK Dead Protection Act came in originally in uh, 84, then was updated uh, 98, then 2018 for uh, the GDPR regime to come in. So we've sort of got an oversimplification, three different regimes in play. There's the sort of DPA regime, Data Protection Act regime, which is broadly the same as GDPR, but the PICA regime sits separately. And PICA has had data breach reporting obligations in it since it came in. It's a different European directive other than the um, data protection directive as its origin. And, and, and PICA only applies to some businesses, telcos, for example, but the bre breach reporting obligation there is 24 hours, not 36. So if you're an organization that could be subject to PECA, P-E-C-R, uh, then... Um, the, then the time's even tighter. But again, if you went to the Cordry website, search top right hand corner, if you put Pika into that, I think there's some stuff on Pika. And obviously, like a lot of these data breaches, talk, talk is the poster child for a lot of the Pika stuff as well. Hey, thanks for that. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, one more question. I was going to Go say, ahead. Richard, uh, just picking up on that that sort of scenario, one of the questions, and I know Steve is actually typing an answer to Edward on this, but it's quite important to understand the relationship between the insurance policy and when they will get involved and provide lawyers and forensics as part of the service of the cyber insurance policy that you buy or the information security policy you buy. I wonder if you could just answer the question, which is how do the insurance specialists, i.e. lawyers, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. So if you are insured or you think you might be insured, make, make that call to the insurer very quickly. Some insurers have uh, dedicated panels of lawyers where on the panel of some insurers, but not others. Some of them have special arrangements with uh, cybersecurity response teams, for example, and uh, that they might be uh, discounted rates that they've agreed in advance. But you, but you still need to square the privilege circle. So you've got to try and have that discussion with the insurers. And ideally, you want to have privilege before anybody goes off instructing people. But um, most insurers have got a plan for that. They've got an emergency helpline, et cetera. And obviously, you can't go off and do your own thing and then inspect the insu uh, expect insurers to pay. They won't do that. So if you have got a policy, 
be make sure that your incident response team are familiar with that policy, who they've got to ring after office hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I had one more question I was going to, I was rushing to answer. Um, somebody asked, uh, do you know if ransomware is a big an issue in more uh, autocratic uh, countries like China and Russia? All I can tell you is that the, the bulk of ransomware out there right now is programmed not to run on any systems that run uh, Chinese language or run uh, a Russian language. And that's because that the threat actors, be them nation states, China, or you know, the, the organized crime uh, uh, organized crime uh, gangs that we talked about, who specialize in ransomware, are, are, are located uh, in in areas that are essentially safe havens, and so part of their the ability for them to uh, um, to operate in countries like Russia is that they don't attack Russian systems. And so you see in the bulk of service level agreements, if you downloaded a ransomware as a service uh, package, that they tell you that it doesn't work on systems that are uh, running Russian language or Chinese. So it's not as prevalent, no, because uh, most of the threat actors are located in those countries and they're quite profitable and they hate to lose that uh, privilege of, of launching attacks from, from those, uh, those geographic areas. Um, anyway, uh, Jonathan, I think that's it. We're, it's eight o'clock. Uh, yep, we're both you, old, old men. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say you've answered every single question that's been up there. So oh, that's, that's good. Great. And, um, Great. I think we're handing hand it back to either Dallam or Steve just to wrap up. But my personal thanks to you. You've been really, really great tonight explaining some of the issues around ransomware and, and picking up on the insurance questions, even though it's not a solicitor's question. So thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, no worries. And if anyone wants any of the articles that I've mentioned and can't find them, just email me and I'll, I'll send the links through. Same here. Thanks for thanks for having us. Uh, uh, if you got, uh, we've we've offered some some more downloads. You can go to our websites and anything. If they, but do not do not hesitate to get in touch with either Jonathan or I if there's anything that comes up after this uh, webinar. But thanks for your patience and and thanks for sticking all the way through. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Great. Thank you very much, Rich. That was really super. And likewise, Jonathan. Well, um, I hope you've taken heed of all the uh, great slides and so on, and also of the invaluable chat and the Q&A. I found that really interesting. We'll capture all of that, of course, in the recording that we're doing, which David will mastermind and massage and put onto the BCS website, and we'll put onto the NLB, North London branch website too. And I guess we may well see it on the ISSD website as well. But um, I'll ask uh, uh, Steve to come in in just a minute. But let me first of all say that that was just fascinating. And Rich and uh, Jonathan, I mean, you know, apart from anything else, I've learned when the best time to go fishing is. And <laughs> in, in terms of fishing, naturally, this is something that you will want to do afterwards. There's loads of good information and we'll be sending out the links to you as well. Um, some of them you've seen in the chat already that allow you to follow up on the good stuff at Cordry, at the good stuff that uh, RISC crew have produced relating to this webinar. Do ta take good uh, time to go through those, tell other people, and also put them into action. Make sure that we start building our capability against ransomware. Okay, well, that's been another good evening from us, I just want to tell you about the next two that we've got. And as you probably know, in Central and North London branches, um, we're doing it virtually every week. So uh, <clears throat> next week on the 15th, we've got something on semiconductors. Semiconductors, why? Well, we like chips with everything we know. And that's not only the British, but also industry and leisure and our world in general, but the materials for chips are getting scarce around them and we're putting chips into more and more things. Well, there's a mismatch there somewhere and we have got the, uh, uh, the CIO of Intel, no less, coming to tell us about the latest advances, concerns and the uh, strategies relating to semiconductors. That's on the 15th, 30 p.m. webinar. Then on the 21st, another one, again on a very topical theme, fake news. Now, I mean, 
you know, what, what am I talking about here? Fake news. Well, uh, you might have heard rather a lot of it coming from just east of Ukraine uh, during the last week, for example. I don't know. Maybe you have, maybe you have, maybe it's coming from the West. Who knows? Well, we need to unpick that one as well and get to recognizing fake, fake news of the future rather better than we have, don't we? Also, we've got US elections coming up. Oh, who knows what's going to be propagating the, work, uh, the, the airwaves? Well, on the 21st, come and join us, and we've got an expert on fake news who will enlighten us about that topic. And then there are lots more, but I'll stop at that um, and not tell you about the following week, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there is lots of good stuff in Central and North London branches and lots of great things in BCS not least things that are coming up in ISSG. Would you like to tell us more about that? Oh, um, I haven't got a list of all of the things that are coming up in ISSG uh, with me tonight, but um, we had a committee meeting last week and uh, we, as, as always, we've got a full programme. That full programme is going to kick off this year with a series of legal day events, which actually um, Paul Skinner, who's also on the call, is busy arranging right now. So. Um, we're looking at uh, the legal aspects, obviously, of information security, but also um, looking uh, looking in detail at some of the technical aspects too. Uh, and um, if, if I might just um, replay my thanks to, to Jonathan and to Richard for a, a fantastic talk tonight. I, I, I always enjoy the talks that are, if you like, uh, related to reality rather than to theory. and, and um, you, you guys uh, made a terrific pitch at uh, a subject that scares the heck out of people, um, mainly because lots of people haven't actually experienced it yet. And they really, really, really do need to know how to react and respond when it happens to them. Richard, I think you said it's a matter of when, not if. Um, I've, I've taken loads of takeaways away from it. I think the first and probably most important one is that if you want to think and speak as quick as Richard Hollis, you need to drink lots of coffee. Uh, and I'm not sure what brand he goes for. Um, I'll, I'll ask him about that later. But um, just, just a few key points. Um, advice, prepare and train and rehearse. Rehearse is, is the thing that builds the muscle memory so that when bad things happen, you know what to do. You haven't got to stop and think about it. Line up those specialists that you might need in advance. So legal people, comms people, forensic analysis people. The, the people who have skills that you will need but don't necessarily have in-house at the time. Um, another thing that Rich said was that, uh, if, if I paraphrase, not all CVEs are equal. Some of them are worse than others. Um, however, what you can, what you do need to know is that you need to patch and then patch and then patch. And, and it's a thankless task. But for as long as we keep buying software that has vulnerabilities in it, and it sounds as if that's going to be forever because I, I can't see them solving that problem overnight. Um, bugs will be introduced, vulnerabilities will be introduce, introduced, and we need, we need to patch them. Um, and then map out all of those five key pillars of the cybersecurity framework and work out which ones are good in your organization and which ones are less good. And then spend some money on the ones that are less good. And my experience is that when you're trying to sell this stuff to the, the people who hold the budgets, the cybersecurity framework, those five pillars, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, they get it. They understand that much better than um, Annex A Control 12.2.1, which is all about malware protection in ISO 27001. They don't get that in the slightest, but they really do understand those five pillars of the cyber security framework. And the final point I thought that was really, really good was work out what your default positions are in advance. So don't pay is a great starting point. If you get hit by ransomware, there's a very, very good chance that your data is already gone. Paying the ransom doesn't guarantee either that you're going to get the keys to decrypt it or that you're going to get it back without it being passed around the web. So don't pay 
is probably a really good starting point because it doesn't it it just does not guarantee anything these are bad people um and and that's it for me just to reiterate once again thanks very very much to jonathan and richard for a fantastic talk this evening and thanks dallin to you and the london branches of the bcs great okay and on that note let's wind up and live for another day look forward to seeing you next time all the best keep safe bye thank carol bye bye thanks guys